I'm Corbin Fry. Welcome to BTV's World War II documentary, World War II, A Time for Heroes. Throughout the years of 1939 and 1945, the world was engulfed with the greatest war man has ever seen. We now know it as World War II. Throughout the war, many lives were lost and heroes made. This documentary tells their stories. The Holocaust, the single most destructive and murderous genocide of all time. Hello, my name is Corbin Fry, and welcome to the Holocaust section of BTV's World War II documentary. When the war began, Nazis started setting up concentration camps, which held Jews and various other groups. Throughout this section, you will hear from Holocaust survivors and experts, as well as veterans who helped liberate the camps. I looked around. The first sight that I saw of this camp was the sight of the barbed wire and the barracks there. There were people everywhere here. That whole selection platform was filled with people. I, I looked around and I saw, where is my mom, my dad and my two older sisters? And I tried to look for them, I couldn't find them. As we were standing here, and the interesting thing is, the train is here. My mother never moved with the crowd that was going toward the gas chamber for selection. And there was a person, tall, with gleaming black boots, who was doing something like that, which made no sense to me whatsoever. So Mangala was doing the selections that day. We stayed here. And the crowd moved. I don't know how she could withstand that, but somehow we were standing. She was not going to go with everybody. And then SS was running, yelling in German, thrilling it. We did not volunteer any information. Miriam and I were dressed alike and looked very much alike. And he approached us, demanding to know, are they twins? And my poor mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good. And the SS nodded yes. And my mother said yes. At that moment, an other SS came, pulled my mother to the right. We were pulled to the left. And as I looked back, I saw my mother's arm stretched out in despair. And that's the last time I saw her. For years and years, I wondered why everybody said that to the left was death, to the right was life. Of course, if the train came on that track, left was death and right was life. But we came and we looked this way. And we were taken back here and we are going to walk around, retrace the direction that we were taken. But actually, we stayed here at the third, between the second and third track. There is that space. We stayed there for probably two and a half hours. There were eight sets of twins and there were more twins found on this transport. Sheer bewilderment. There is no way to describe to anybody how one would feel. But in our transport, there were a total of 16 sets of twins, and there was one mother who was permitted to stay with the twins. I was always sick, I was always from my stomach sickness. Yeah. And the soup? Mm -mm. They once gave me a soup and there was a, like a total piece of meat. And the German, and I asked, I looked at it and I asked, what is this? He said, maybe your sister or your brother, a piece of him. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I started crying. Mm. I couldn't stop. And he said, he took me by the neck and said, you better leave here because if not, you're going to get killed. He said, okay, go ahead and kill me. It's, it's nothing worth living because he didn't have any. We were tired, worked up. We were this skinny. We came out, you know. And then now, that's what it was. We had a bad, bad time. A bad, we had a murderous time. They killed, and if they find we were doing the shells for the guns, and if the shells had a scratch, and you didn't watch, they took you out and beat you that you couldn't stand up. Yeah, yeah they, I got it because I, it was at night and I must have closed my eyes, you know, and just, and the machine was making scratches on the shelves. And we had a German woman, you know, a Nazi woman. She was an SS woman. She came and looked at me and she said, showed me, and she said, here, look what you did. And I said, well, the machine, the, the thing is broken, she said, why didn't you tell the mechanic to fix it? I said, I told him. He was busy. She said, she closed her fist and just hit me and broke tea, three front teeth. My bleeding didn't start for days. I was so sick from it, but nothing could help. Nobody helped, nobody. I would have preferred that my parents did when I was about eight or nine, eight more likely, is to leave our home and cross the border into Romania. I was aware that we could do that in one hour walking on our railroad track. By the time my parents realized it, end of 1943, it was too late because our house was surrounded by young Nazi kids and we were practically under house arrest. You see what I mean? So they announced that women and children should congregate on one side and those on the other. We knew this is a Bill McCoy. This is not a picnic to Shackamuck Park. This was a Bill McCoy. And, and, and my mother really saved my life. She pushed me away. She said, don't stay with us because we're all going to get killed. We're all going to be just murdered. So she pushed me aside, and I went with the adults. And when you're a young boy like you guys, when, they, when your mother pushes you aside, and you don't ask any questions, but she foresaw what happened, say. She reviewed the situation real quickly, like, and, and, and she was right. The trucks, all those women and children, the infirm, the old and the sick, were taken away on trucks in a, in a forest in the forest, and they were just mowed down like flies. And if, I, and if I stayed with my mother, there would be a vacant spot in Mackey Arena at Purdue, you follow me? Because I go to the, all the home games at Purdue games. There would be one vacant seat. From the moment we stepped down on the cement platform, I, my little mind, I said, this is hell on earth if there is a hell. And therefore, I could never see anything mm -hmm. that had anything to do with humanity or with culture or anything like that. It was a gruesome story when the cattle cars arrived to Beer Canal and they embarked us and on the platform stood this handsome, gorgeous guy, Dr. Joseph Mengele. He, he, was like a, he looked like Clark Gable but he was the sadist. He was the one who decided who should live and who should die. He, uh, the first thing that he hollered out is, Zwilling and Austraten, twins step out. And I and my sister, we were very identical and we didn't know what to do. So uh, my sister said, we have to step out because he will know that we are twins. We didn't know what's waiting for us. After 
we, they took us to the barracks. Next day, they started with the experiments. They uh, undressed us. We were completely nude in front of him for hours and hours. He was, the girls were taking blood from one arm and injected us with some unknown monstrosities in the other arm and we got very sick. One day we were like in a fire, the next day we were, uh, we were like in the freezer and we all were very, very sick. His uh, mission was to uh, study the twins, to, uh, to uh, um, make the German next generation all blue-eyed and blonde. That was his mission, and uh, he was doing that every single day. He was punishing us, and we were just getting sicker and sicker. And uh, towards the end, he wanted to, to pair up the uh, boy twins with the girl twins and see what kind of offspring, offsprings we will produce. But thank God, the Americans were already coming in and the Russians from the other side, and we were freed. He never had the chance to do what he uh, wanted to do. So thank God we came to the United States, and you should all be very happy and proud. You're in the best country in this world. The first night when we arrived, we were marched from the shower room to this barrack, and there were children, maybe 250, 300, all from age 1 to 13. Some of them have been here for quite some time. And uh, they gave us the meal, the evening meal, but Miriam and I, even though we had nothing to eat for um, four days, we didn't want to eat it because it wasn't kosher. We came from a very religious family, so we gave it to two girls who were showing us around and they were kind of laughing at our innocence. If you want to survive this place, you better learn to eat everything. Then we went to sleep. No, before we went to sleep, they wanted to show us what's going on in this camp. And they were so eager to share with us everything and they told us everybody the Jews are brought here, they are killed within a few hours. And I said, what do you mean killed? They said, they are burning them. So we went to the back, this would be the back barrack, our barrack. You're going to see the wooden ones that look like barns, have a door in the back and a door in the front. And we went to the back and we looked in this direction where there are the ruins of the gas chamber and crematorium now, but there were one, two, and the other side, three, four crematoriums. Actually, crematorium two and three and four and five, because Auschwitz one is called crematorium one, correct? And you as children saw heaps of dead bodies? Yes, we did. Actually, what happened here uh, was that as the gurney was filled with bodies collected during the day, one of the girls who was in the twins barrack recognized her mother. So we watched bodies, seeing dead bodies, it was a daily thing. We saw dead bodies that first night when I went to the latrine because I couldn't sleep. And our barrack had a latrine. There were the three the corpses of three dead children, naked and shriveled, and this is when I understood that I, as a 10-year-old, have to do something, not to end up on the barrack floor. And this is when I made a pledge, a silent pledge, that I will do anything in my power to make sure that Miriam and I would not end up on that filthy line. Our daily, the, you know, the liberation, we had a hard time. The Jews got killed one in another. When, you know, and I couldn't find a, one of my sisters or my brothers. None, none of them were left. They all went to Auschwitz, all of them. All the conditions, of course, were, were terrible. Uh, and uh, largely, uh, people had to uh, work uh, very long hours uh, 
the living condition themselves. Uh, and this is something my mother did talk about a bit, uh, is where she had to share uh, in a fairly narrow bunk uh, with uh, several people and they all slept together uh, and nobody could move because they were so close together that you couldn't even turn around. Uh, and uh, so that was one thing she recounted. Uh, also the uh, uh, roll calls in the very early morning, they were all awakened to you know, 3, 4 a.m. and then had to stand in the either freezing cold if it was winter or very hot uh, sun in the summers uh, for long periods of time while the Nazis or the SS uh, did their count, making sure that the number of prisoners matched with the records. Uh, so that was one of the most, I think, grueling things uh, uh, for most of the prisoners. Uh, and uh, certainly my mother felt uh, that that was uh, very harsh and uh, drained her strength. And after that, she had, of course, to go and work uh, for very long hours during the day. My father had passed away when I was a year old. And um, my grandparents, like so many other older people, did not believe, nor did they want to believe, of the horrors that were coming, and so they did not leave Germany. And they eventually died. My father's parents died in the gas chambers at Dachau, and 50 years later, upon my first visit back to Berlin, I found out that my mother's father died at the Sachsenhausen camp in Germany. It was a cup of brown coffee. In the morning? In the morning, that was it. That was it. That was it. At noon, if we were in experiment in Auschwitz one, where we were standing naked and they were studying us, we got no lunch. But that was almost as good as getting lunch here because the lunch we got here we couldn't eat. It was that gooey white stuff that looks like cream of wheat. There are some pictures in the camp, I'm sure, somewhere. But it was pasty and you couldn't swallow it. It would not go down. I don't know what it was made out of. So the only edible food you got was at night. And that was the other tragic thing. You got a two and a half piece slice of bread. And then, a, again, a cup of coffee. Now, if you are ever hungry and you want to survive, you do not eat at night. You save it for the next day. Because if you don't have any food for a whole day, you can feel your stomach hurting and growling without any food in it. Well, the logical thing for me was to save it for next day. And when I did, many times the bread was gone in the morning, stolen by the huge rats that were roaming in our barracks. So every rats. rats, huge rats. And every single night, uh, that I was in Auschwitz, I struggled to make a decision. Should I eat that bread today and have something to eat, or should I gamble and save it for tomorrow? Uh, okay. We suffered tremendously. My young brothers, I had two very young brothers, and we were hungry. We didn't know, you know, we ate the peels from the potatoes, not the potatoes, the peels from the potatoes. I always got so sick from it. And uh, that was until they started taking out the people. And it started right end of 1940. They started taking out to the camps, you know, to the concentration camps, like to Auschwitz and to Birkenau and to Maidan. What's the thing that you remember most from Auschwitz? Probably the killing, the hunger, and the killing, and the cold, and um, the lice, and the diseases of all kinds. And um, Mr. Elster was a, uh, was a hidden child. Can you explain what that was and what you went through during the Holocaust? Yes. Well, I escaped from the liquidation when they came in to kill all the inhabitants in our town. And I wound up being hidden by a Polish couple in the attic for two years. And if you can imagine what it would be like to survive two winters in a cold attic or uh, two hot summers. It was quite an existence. 
It's about. hard to imagine, too, from what we live today to Especially what... Especially when you're 10 or 11 years of age. When, they, when the festivals were, he was there, and I was invited from Wagner's in their home. And here I met Hitler. And everybody of the very, very famous singers came in and said, Hi, Hitler, my Führer. And I was the only one he said, Good day, Mr. Hitler. If we were alone, he would have shot me immediately. But that came later. You know, he used me as a singer, as propaganda, to give me contracts in London and in Paris to sing as the best German singer, which I was. And after I done that, he put me in the concentration camp. November 9th, 1938 was the start of the end for Jews in Germany. And my mother and I um, needed to get out, wanted to get out. And the only place left in the world that would take refugees was Shanghai. America closed their doors, Canada closed their doors, the entire world closed their doors. And so my mother and I ended up in Shanghai. No, no. We were children too. We uh -huh. helped the little ones. We uh, had, yes, I, I, yeah, of yeah. We, we helped the little ones as much as we could. But when you are a ten-year-old child and you try to figure out how to survive in this place, it took us days and days. Because when the other trains with these German soldiers came, they stopped us and put us aside. So and the, the things were closed, locked up. No body. No food. We were all dying, but somehow we were young girls. They were all young, like me, you know. There were eight wagons or ten trays packed with young teenagers. It took us a while. They took us to the camp, to the concentration camp, where we were kept there. We were staying in those built things, you know, like barracks and with the beds straw on it hard as well and one time at night we were sleeping some girls were yelling we didn't know what they were yelling they said the cats are here they let I said I looked around and I said girls it's not cats it's rats as big as this they let them in one girl missed the ear we jumped up all and we stayed in the middle of this little barrack. I don't know how they went out. I, we don't know. I don't know. We seem to get attuned to certain things. But uh, living on one meal a day, some soup and a piece of bread, and uh, you hope that you will survive one day at a time. And, uh, we're very fortunate. Those concentration camps, we are very very secret. Nobody could see them, nobody could go near them, nobody knows. There were only rumors they couldn't go out to do something. I was there and then, and then, and My father more so than my mother, and he in particular, uh, did talk about uh, a variety of uh, uh, experiences uh, both uh, during the labor camps uh, he served in uh, uh, during the first part of the war uh, where he worked mainly in hard labor uh, building roads in various parts of Poland and also he talked about uh, his experiences in Auschwitz uh, the selection process when he first arrived uh, in Auschwitz and the ramp and where he met well he was met I should say uh, by uh, Dr. Mengele, who's famously known, obviously, for uh, doing the selection. So he, he described those things. He also described uh, various experiences in the camp. Uh, uh, one episode that I remember well is when uh, he got sick 
uh, and was sent to the hospital there, uh, which was always a very problematic because a lot of people who were, of course, uh, sick uh, were then uh, sent to their death. Uh, but uh, he said that uh, essentially he was, he wouldn't attribute uh, any, anything particular to why he was saved, but what he said, just pure luck. Uh, that you know he was sort of uh, led out of the hospital the day before uh, the, the other patients were sent to the uh, gas chambers. Um, now uh, my mother, I think, as I said, was very m much more reluctant, and she talked primarily about her experiences in the Lodz ghetto, where she spent most of her war years, uh, and she, when the ghetto was uh, liquidated so that uh, all the survivors uh, in January 1944 were then sent to Auschwitz uh, and where then she spent several uh, months in the, in the camp there. But she only described those things fairly generally. She didn't go much into specifics. Well, I would say the best chance to live were maybe children between 15, maybe to 35 because they were still young and strong enough to handle it. But the very young children like me, there weren't that many who made it. But a cousin of mine came out from Auschwitz and they, he was trying to run away. And the things were electrocyte, you know, electric. Yeah. So he jumped this and a Russian, a German Nazi saw him and shot his head. He lived, he was in, in Canada, but he died after a while. And Mangala was working on him. You know, this doctor that was working on all the people, Mangala. Turned out 20,000 Jews ended up in Shanghai. And how old were you at that time? Four. Four. I was four when we left Germany. Shanghai was my, uh, was my world. That's where I grew up. I had many, many Jewish people. I worked three years underground, had to escape. I was constantly in danger to be shot. Comes every minute. When I went, we worked with a coat. When they said kind regards, that means I need you immediately. When I was there, I went in the hotel. I saw, without looking behind me, I know the Gestapo man was behind me. I went to the exit out, and I had several in big cities like Berlin, Hamburg, Munich. I had several people who were anti-Nazi who was hiding me in their home. Well, I remember uh, mostly when we were uh, cold and hungry and uh, working long hours, uh, very early in the morning to late at night. And uh, but we were surviving while uh, the rest of my family was not that fortunate. They were sent to Auschwitz and most of them were killed over there. What? Good. I had seven siblings before the war. And after the war, only three of us survived. Uh, I had a married sister who had a husband and three children of her own, and they were all murdered in Auschwitz. Oh, actually, we knew that there were Mengele who wanted to kill us, but I was not going to be the one. I was going to beat the art. That was my attitude from the first day I arrived here. It was very bad. We, we didn't know what is, well, why is it coming to us? Why are they doing this to us? What did we do to any people? They said, because you're Jews. They are, they're Nazis. Because you're Jews, you deserve what's coming. I was in London singing and we traveled back with the Gestapo and I was not taken, not at all. And then, Going home, she put me in a car and put me in the concentration camp, Buchenwald. Short after the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
and when the Japanese took over in Shanghai, that is when they put us into the ghetto, which is called Hongkyu. And um, we lived uh, among the starving Chinese citizens. Um, my mother worked, my mother who is an was an intellectual, college-educated woman, whose family were bankers in Germany, worked in a soup kitchen. We had to sell everything to get money to get out of Germany. And um, we lived, um, five of us, we were lucky, we lived in one room. We didn't live in the dorm type rooms that so many of the people in the internment camp, now this was an internment camp, not a concentration camp, lived. And, um, but, you know, there was no flush toilet, no, no heat, no running water. Here I was, among with the adults, they put us on a ship. If you look at a map, the Baltic states, Riga was the port as well as the capital of the city. They put us on a ship, and it was not a passenger ship, it was a freighter. But they, they put it down in a hull, but they keep gasoline, all kind of junk supplies. It was a, it was a freighter, a merchant marine, a merchant ship. And, and, I, and I remember we were down to like sardines. I remember I asked, we asked for water or something. So that I still remember those German soldiers, they, they thought it was funny. They thought of a big shot, they thought of a, it was really humorous to them. Like a bunch of animals down below asking for water, like cows or sheep. So they lowered the hose into the Baltic Sea and sprinkled on it like a bunch of fish. And this incident, haunted me later on in life. Later on in life, when we, when we were here in the States and we went to Red, Red Lobster, the two children were young. And as, as we, we don't go to Red Lobster too often, nobody does, but it's a big deal when you go to Red Lobster back in those days. And as you've been in a Red Lobster restaurant, to a replica of their trademark, there is little aqua, what do you call that thing? They have little fishes jumping around in the aquarium. aquarium. <laughs> and when I saw that, it took me back to the day when I was in that ship, like a little sardine. And my son, Alex, who's an adult, he's a, he happens to be a podiatrist. He's a, oh, you met Alex. And he, and he was just eight, and the girl was five. And we, uh, I, I took him to Red Lobster, and I never knew he would hit me like that. You know what I mean? So, and, he's, and now he said, well, Dad, what's the matter? What happened? I don't want to talk about it. He, says, he doesn't say, you learn as you get older. It doesn't take much to ignite a, a, a sad experience in one's life. Well, I think the worst thing that, uh, uh, I don't know if it was, directed with my father had a previous family uh, during the war. He was married uh, and had a small child, a five-year-old girl. Uh, and uh, what, uh, you know, the worst thing that happened to him was to lose that family. Uh, and uh, he's the one that survived with uh, both his first wife and this little girl uh, whose, whose name was Rachel. Uh, who's my sister, of course, but I never knew her uh, since she, she died in 1943 in, a, in another uh, camp, uh, another extermination camp uh, known as Helmno uh, in central Poland. So that was, uh, I think, the worst thing uh, that uh, certainly befell my father. Uh, in terms of my mother, uh, she rec I think the, the worst experience she encountered, that's, again, something that's reflected in many accounts of uh, the prisoners is uh, the first moments in Auschwitz where she came uh, with her mother and her brother uh, and uh, at the selection process uh, uh, they were all separated and uh, her mother was sent directly to the uh, gas chamber and she never saw her again. Uh, her brother also was separated of course to the men's camp he, uh, but he, uh, he did not survive. Uh, you know, he, he lived for a little bit at the camp, but did not survive. So 
And for her, the separation from her family, again, was the most difficult thing. There were many Jewish in, and there were lots of Germans in, and I was among the Germans, and they treated us not very good, but we got to eat, and we could not say anything against the government, against uh, Hitler. But if we did, we were punished. I did. A Gestapo man got fresh with me and embraced me, and I hit him very badly in the stomach. I was very strong, and he got a knife out and put the knife in my side. They would open their patch and drop the cycle on me. Is that correct? This is that instead of the water coming from the shower head, the cyclone B came from there. Cyclone B operated like dry ice. And then it would go to the floor, and then the dry ice turned to gas, and the gas was rising. So you can see the hatch there, they would go on the roof of the gas chamber and drop it in. And then once the bodies were dead, all these doors were hermetically sealed. So the gas would just stay in here. Once the bodies were dead, I don't know if the doors here have a peephole. I'm really curious, but most of them did. Had a peephole that somebody from outside could watch what was going on inside. And once everybody was dead, then they would open the door. That's what Dr. Munch testified to. 10 years ago, they were here in this gas chamber with the Nazi doctor who watched what was going on inside. The killings, the beatings, the hunger, that's what was disturbing. I don't know, we didn't have, we wanted water. You couldn't have it. If you were thirsty, you couldn't have it. If you were hungry, you couldn't have it. They gave you what they gave you, and that's all. You couldn't ask for more. Yeah, you ask for more, you get killed. You couldn't ask any question, because if you ask a question, they shoot you. Then we had one evening to move, and there I, I took the opportunity to run away. It was dark, and I find that was on the border already. I find a car which I stopped. It was a Dutch man who took me to Holland, to Amsterdam. The guard tower was there. We also watched the guards watching us. And what I used to love to see is when the airplanes would fly overhead, they would come make American airplanes, make a huge yellow smoke circle. And then we knew that they are not going to bomb inside the circle. And they would bomb outside and the guards would run for their life. And we would just applaud. <laughs> that was over. It was all a little game. All, we knew that someday soon we would survive, thanks to those airplanes that were flying overhead. Otherwise, I didn't know that there was a world beyond the camp. Children lose their point of reference very fast. To me, the whole world was one big concentration camp. When they found the concentration camps and the way people had been treated, each unit was required to send one representative to the Holocaust camps to Burke. I think he went, they went to Belson and, uh, well, I know they went to Belson, but they sent these, a representative with a camera from each unit to go and get recorded evidence to take back to their unit so everybody would know what had happened, so there would be no doubt in anyone's mind. We came to a roadblock then at the other side of town, 
the engineers came up and there was trees that the Germans had pulled trees and that was just the site of the concentration camp. Well, we were in convoy, but they finally got the, the trees out of the way and we moved on around about a couple of miles out of town. We came to this complex, which was, looked like a prison. Had a big fence all the way around. <clears throat> in the distance, you can see uh, smokestacks and a, a big complex. There was still smoke coming out of the, the smokestacks. And our convoy stopped. Convoys, you know, you move along a little bit and you stop and you move. Well, I was right next to the fence and the infantry already had taken over this little uh, concentration camp. And uh, we had trucks and ambulances right across the fence from me. They were loading up the survivors. And some of them on stretchers and some of them were walking dead. I mean, they just were skin and bones, just walking skeletons almost been starved to death and they they were not smiling they were they, I don't think they were they were in a stupor they didn't realize I don't think that they were uh, were being liberated they just uh, were just completely out of it you know but uh, I wondered how many of those survived it was just a, a pitiful sight to see and a, that was a sight that's indelible in my mind it will always be you know what I saw there my dad was too tender-hearted to go. He knew what he was going to find. He sent one of his lieutenants instead, but he did bring back the pictures, and I have seen the pictures, and they were horrible. In 1945, we knew that the Russians, that Poland was liberated with the Russians. We know that they came, came near us, but the factories were still going on, the ammunition factories. And we were working, and one day, I saw a German running in, a Nazi, an assessment. And he said to one of the other Germans, you know, Jewish is like German. You understand a little. When the Germans speak, we can catch on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they said that the Russians are nearing. But they still didn't believe it. But then they came in. But they still started killing us. And they wanted to take us out. They brought trains. They brought trains to take us to Auschwitz. The Germans brought trains to take us to Auschwitz. But for some reason, they couldn't take all of us. So they took some of us. I know some friends of mine went. They came out, but they came out sick. My cousin came out of Auschwitz and died in, in Poland after the war. Yes. He was sick from everything. And the Russians came in in 1949, uh, 45. They opened it. The, they didn't come in to us in the camps. Somebody opened the gates. The Germans were running already. But some the, the Russians killed. Some of them. I saw one of them. And I said, this one is worth being killed. He was lying there. We were still hiding. We were afraid to go out because the shooting was going on. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting in the camps until uh, the afternoon that when we walked out and we came out, the Poles had a nerve to ask us, so many left of you? And I said, oh my God, now it starts again. But they, they didn't bother us anymore. And uh, that's when we came out, I wanted to go home to my place. That was Chernstachal, behind our thing. And uh, when I, I we, but the trains weren't taking us. And we were five girls that will stay together, you know. They're still alive, you know, five of us. Were and uh, we stayed together and we, waited until the train started. And we were sleeping in a God, There was some place that they gave us to sleep. We were sleeping there and we had to put the beds to the door, to the door so the Russians wouldn't come in. These were blown up and then they marched us to Auschwitz one in the middle of the night. And anybody who could not walk fast enough was shot on the spot. 
So, so they didn't move the children out when they tried to move everybody? That is not the truth. What they did, they told us that everybody after the evening meal to go outside because we are taking you deep into Germany to, for your protection because the fighting is too close. I decided that I did not like the Nazis when they were winning the war. I wasn't going to be that close to them when they were losing it. <laughs> so we stayed behind in the barrack and amazingly, they did not come in to force us out. And 7,000 people stayed behind. Wow. And these were the ones that were liberated by the Russians. Yeah. But they have, the camp was 100,000 two months earlier and by January 18, when we were marched to Auschwitz one, they were about 7,000. So you can see how massive evacuations they have done. And most, many of those have died in the death marches because they were marching them throughout Germany in conditions like that. The percentage of survivors, even those who survived the camp was very, very small. Starved out bodies stacked like cordwood. Uh, one of the most telling pictures I've ever seen was pictures of the G German guards after the inmates got through with them. They literally tore them apart with their hands. I mean, these people had no faces left. They were still in their uniforms, but they had just taken them and torn them completely apart. Uh, Buchenwald, yeah. they had an old uh, woman who was in charge of that. And they went in there, and they, oh, Goring, usually the Air Force people, you know, he tried to take care of them. But they went, when they liberated that, they found lampshades. It was made out of um, uh, real big guys' forearm, you know, still had tattoos on them. With it. They butchered them or skinned them and, and made lampshades out of their forearm. There was one. One woman that was in charge of a prison camp, and I don't know which one this was, but she was called the Bitch of Buchenwald, I believe it was. And uh, she had, uh, for one thing, she had uh, uh, globes that go around, lamps made of human skin with tattoos on them and this sort of thing. Uh, the things like this, you know, that. It's just hard to imagine people that can be can be that degraded. They got caught with the prisoners. When when the tanks were coming in to liberate the camps, at this time the inmates knew that they couldn't be hurt, that the guards weren't going to get them, and they took their revenge. And they scrambled them up pretty bad. Yeah, I've I've seen those pictures and they still they stay with me. On the night of January 18, 60 years ago. We were marched in the middle of the night from Birkenau to Auschwitz I. When we reached these gates, the Nazis disappeared, like the earth swallowed them up. We raced for these two-story buildings because we didn't know what that meant, if they were going to start shooting and leveling us all. As we I end, ran into one of the buildings, Miriam and I were separated. And when I was inside, I all of a sudden couldn't find Miriam. And I, this is the first time since I've been in Auschwitz, I was really scared that I would never see my sister again. And so I walked in and out of these buildings until I bumped in her, into her in one of the doorways. From there on, we made a decision that any time there is a confusing situation that we need to hold hands when we don't know what's going on. Now, I can tell you that there were a set of twins, the Goodman twins, they were seven. They were separated at the death march, and they didn't find each other for eight years. And there was an other set of twins that the twin lives in Israel. He didn't find his twin brother ever again. So it was very confusing, very, very difficult. So we went out and walked in the street, but the Russians had a, a curfew. Five o'clock, you couldn't walk anymore in the street because this was right after the war, you know. So we five girls walking with the Russians in the, the tree. 
two Russians behind us, five girls. And we were talking Jewish. We didn't know any language to put Jewish or Polish, but we were talking Jewish. One of the Russians came and said, are you Jewish? And I said, of course we're Jewish. Don't you see, look at us. <laughs> we were like this and like this and dirty and not dressed. He said, yeah, we're Jewish. He said, well, I'm a Jewish Russian. He said, come on, I take you and put you somewhere up. He put us up, okay, it was fine, but we had where to sleep this day. Then they opened the Jewish, like a little organization to check who was left, who didn't come back. Every day I went there. Every day I looked at the papers, you know. I saw my name, but it was where I was alive, you know. And I talked to one of them and I said, where are the rest of them? She said, go to Auschwitz. And you will see where the rest of them are. They didn't come out. That was the end. Then we went every day and every day. And then when we come back to Lodge, I met him at the same organ the little organization that they grounded, you know, they made so people will know who is left and who isn't left. People come together. I met my my husband there and we were talking and he said his parents didn't make it. His sister and three brothers didn't make it. I said, well, mine didn't make it neither. I'm alone. That's what, and all the girls were with us, you know. And uh, we were all alone. That was the thing. And we walked out in the street. And again, they asked, too many of you left. What happened? We thought that you all got killed in Auschwitz or in Birkenau or in Buchenwald or in Majdanek. I said, I wasn't there, but we were in another hell. The same hell that Majdanek in Buchenwald and any other camp. Oh, these uh, people were laying around and some of them were, uh, you know, just skeleton and, and bloated up. And I seen some of them, they was with flies that already uh, on the corner of the mouth and their eyes that already laid eggs on their and it, face and you know around and, and they were they were still alive and uh, uh, Eisenhower Patton had all all these German doctors of course uh, let all the civilians come in there made them win and look at this and um, uh, made them take care of them of course the ones already dead the skeletons like why they you know took them and, and uh, they dug big trenches and threw them in there and, there were open pits out there with bodies scattered every place and uh, still smoke coming out of the smokestacks, as I said, where they had burned, were burning the bodies. And uh, some of our boys the next day uh, got to go in and, and tour the camp and I really didn't want to see it and I, I, it was just too much for me to, to, to see. Our, uh, our officials, our officers uh, went into the, the town and declared uh, it was under uh, I forget the name for it, but they they made the officials of the town come out with their wives and tour the camp. Of course, the wives, a lot of them got sick, and uh, but they wanted them to see. And they said, we didn't know this was going on. And they were only two miles away, and the smell was from the burning bodies was permeating the whole valley. I, they, you know, they, there's no way they could not have known what was going on. And. Uh, uh, I don't know what camp it was, but Eisenhower and Patton toured one of the camps also. And Patton, who was used to seeing dead daily in combat, he was following the troops and everything, but he, he got sick and, and, and threw up, you know, this hardened veteran, General Patton. But uh, there was one story told also that some of the German, uh, German guards tried to get away from the camp and escape, and they were shot outside on the road, outside the, the prison camp. And our tankers who had viewed what was going on, they came to these bodies and they didn't bother, they didn't even 
bother to go around them. They just ran right over. Which was, this was war, you know, and it, it's a sad thing to see. But uh, We didn't get inside of the prison, but we saw piles of bodies and bones outside of the prison. And it looked like it was quite a few. Now, I have no idea how many there was, but uh, probably there was someone made a report on it, how many there was. And they lined us up again, a couple of guards, and you could hear the war, the, the, the military operation coming closer and closer. I said, boy, I wish I could. Who, I didn't know who would be there, British or Allied forces, somebody would be there on the other side. It wouldn't be the Russians, so it would be Allies. I don't know whether Americans or British. We didn't know who, who, for, where, who the enemy was for them, or who our friends would be. You see what I'm saying? So, so, and one time, you know, the like, just adrenaline keeps flowing, and they line us up again, and we went to the I guess, South Church Street. It was all rubble on both sides. No big deal. I mean, I was sitting here, and the teachers over there were building just to be. So, if I decided to make a run for it, a hole somewhere, I just. Make a, would have to run just maybe a few meters, a few yards, that's all. And then, I, uh, my, as I say, my emotions, and all of a sudden, you know, like you fellows follow football. Remember Marshall Falk for the Colts a few years ago? You remember? So I, and I knew nothing about college football at the time. And I, I, I said to myself, I ran those few yards zigzag. I figured my childish attitude would be that the bullets wouldn't be able to hit me. I mean, like a star halfback, like Marshall Falk or something, or this guy James right now for the Colts, for example. You follow me? And I hid in a hole, and I checked myself, so to speak, and the, the quietness, and it's, quietness can scare you too. It was just strangely quiet all of a sudden, because the guard didn't know, there's a couple of guards and a hundred of us or something. And we all looked like, oh, just walking slowly because we couldn't walk too well. And I hid in that hole and I stayed there, it sounded, felt like a lifetime. Actually, probably three, four, five hours. And all of a sudden, I hear a foreign language, a language which I've never heard before in my short life. And it was, an, it was English, it was American Advanced Party of the American Army. Sometimes happiness brings out tears in a person. You follow me? So I jumped, I came out of the hole, and I stood there on this GI. I didn't know who he was. It turns out to be a GI, an American. So he looked at me, and he turned to his, he happened to be a truck, a, a mess truck. You know, in military term, the mess truck is a truck which shows the kitchen. It's, it's something you learn, that say. It's a mess truck. And he turned to his truck, and he handed me a Coca-Cola. So my first encounter with freedom, I worked for years I, in the prison as you line up, lay in the bunk, lie in the bunk, bunk. What would the first moment look like of freedom if there is such a thing? Because it was millions of miles away, freedom, the idea of freedom. So I never knew what freedom was once they put you in the concentration camp for four years. And even in the leaving Riga as a civilian, the anti-Semitism, they hated Jews badly. I mean, I remember as a young boy, when there were four guys standing over here, I'd walk across the street over here. They'd always beat you up. They know you were Jewish. See? But anyway, I stood there. I couldn't speak his language. So he turns to his truck and gives me a Coca-Cola. Well, he didn't exactly have a lot of love for the German military at that time. I can tell you that right now, particularly the not the rank and file German soldier, but the, the Nazi, the hardcore people that, that perpetrated this type of uh, atrocity. He just had no use for them at all. I saw the, uh, I saw the people, or the, I couldn't imagine people that could uh, treat other human beings uh, as they did in these prison camps. You know, you wouldn't treat an animal like some of these human beings that uh, were in prison camps. Hitler was a real horrible man to do that, horrible. Perhaps the things that we should emphasize, uh, because we tend to concentrate uh, a lot on the negative, on the bad, terrible things that happened there, and I think we should certainly recognize that. Uh, but I think uh, we need also to sort of understand that 
even in the midst of the horror that Auschwitz was, that place still had love and it, it had laughter. Um, people, uh, uh, you know, sort of tried to make the best in those conditions and the fact that they were able to, to love and to laugh uh, is, I think, something that we also need to be aware of. And, and, uh, and I think that speaks to sort of the human condition. Uh, that even in you know, the most terrible of things, uh, when uh, pe you know, people are mistreated uh, in a way that is uh, incomprehensible, they, they still have the ability and the strength to reach within themselves, uh, to find something within themselves that allows them to appreciate uh, the good part of, of humanity. Uh, and I think that we need to recognize before that uh, in this uh, horror of horrors, uh, human dignity survives. Every single survivor, every single one of them, in my opinion, should be extremely proud that they survived, that they have triumphed. And I think those who can function without the big baggage that most of them still carry should be even prouder. Because it's not enough to survive a tragedy you still need to be a happy human being. Throughout the course of the war, 11 million innocent men, women, and children, mainly of the Jewish religion, were murdered in the Holocaust. While it is impossible to say that any good came from the Holocaust, we try to make the best of it and learn from the mistakes of others and hope that something like this will never happen again. I am deeply touched that you are here with me in Auschwitz. I am glad to see Many heads of state make the journey to learn that the price of unchecked hatred and prejudice is a bold tragedy like Auschwitz. I am passing on this torch to you, to all of you today, with the hope that you can teach the world about what happened here in Auschwitz, work to eliminate hatred and prejudice, and teach the world to heal by forgiving those who hurt us.